Hovindism number three, the conservation of angular momentum. When we last left Mr. Hovind, he was relating his fanciful tale regarding his encounter with an unnamed UC Berkeley professor who happened to carry no less than six middle school science textbooks with him that he regularly quoted. I said, sir, could I ask you a couple questions? He said, sure, what would you like to know? I said, well, sir, you told me 20 billion years ago, all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where did all this dirt come from? Mr. Hoban continues to use his straw man argument. As the middle school textbook quoted by Mr. Hoban in the previous segment made clear, the Big Bang Theory does not explain the origin of the universe, only its current development. Also, nucleosynthesis, i.e. the formation of atomic nuclei, occurred after the onset of expansion, not before. You know, uh, who made matter? This question requires the same fundamental misunderstanding of physics as what makes salt crystals form. Matter, defined by an elementary science class, is going to differ greatly from the definition used by physics. A common definition used by physicists is anything composed of elementary fermions. Fermions are the 12 quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom, along with their antiversions, and the 12 leptons, electron, neutrino, electron, muon, neutrino, muon, tau, neutrino, and tau. In much the same way that salt crystals do not form until a solution is cooled sufficiently, fermions did not combine to form protons and neutrons until the universe had cooled sufficiently. In the same way, protons and neutrons did not combine to form atomic nuclei until further cooling occurred. No one is responsible for forming salt crystals or matter. Both form according to natural processes. No magic needed. He said, we don't know about that for sure. And that is why physicists still have jobs. I said, all right, sir, now hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth, you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. Actually, most science would ask for the evidence that leads to such an outlandish claim. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a Big Bang and you don't know where the dirt came from. Dirt results from erosion. The Big Bang Theory describes the expansion of space-time. There is no mention of dirt. So basically, I believe in the beginning God and you believe in the beginning dirt. Mr. Hoven has returned to ridiculing his own straw man argument. Also, there is no belief in science because there is no faith in science. Every claim requires evidence. Don't tell me my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir. They're both religious. Psychological projection is a common defense mechanism in which one attributes his own unwanted or unacceptable qualities, thoughts, or emotions to others. In short, Mr. Hovind appears to be suffering from a great deal of denial regarding the nature of creationism. The news media tries to make it look like it is science versus religion. Has anyone else noticed just how far Mr. Hovind has wandered from the topic of the UC Berkeley professor? And, for the record, biology and physics are fields of scientific study, while creationism is a religious pseudoscience. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas, and the news media said, see, this is religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. If Mr. Hovind is your leader of anything, you have some serious problems to work through. There is no scientific debate regarding the validity of evolution or the Big Bang. The debate is political and religious and largely relegated to the United States. There's nothing better than a first world nation trying to cultivate third world science. What are they trying to imply just by the headline? Succinctly that certain religious leaders, i.e. Mr. Hovind, oppose science because of their faith-based beliefs. They're trying to imply that evolution is part of science, aren't they? Evolutionary theory is the foundational principle of modern biology. It is the reason that drug trials can be conducted in mice before they are done in people. Because as we all know, exposing humans to completely unknown compounds is always fun. And safe. When it's not, both are religious. Mr. Hovind is still projecting. Evolution is as much a religion as gravity. See, both creation and evolution are inherently religious. Repeating an error does not correct it. The difference is the evolution religion is tax-supported. That's the difference. By Mr. Hoban's logic, the religions of calculus and English literature, along with music and geometry and government and economics, are also 
tax supported. And by the way, they couldn't survive without tax support either. Darwin published Evolutionary Theory in 1859. The Butler Act in Tennessee, which forbade the teaching of evolution, was not repealed until 1967. It would not be until 1968 that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that laws forbidding the teaching of evolutionary theory were unconstitutional. It was not until 1987 that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that religion could not be taught as science. In short, evolutionary theory survived based on the supporting evidence and has withstood the immense opposition brought by creationists is creationism that attempts to survive through legislation. Now these two timelines are on this uh, table right here. The top timeline represents what the Bible teaches. 6,000 years ago God made everything. 4,400 years ago there was a flood. 2,000 years ago Jesus came. And there we are today waiting for the Lord to come back in about five minutes. That's the Bible view. Amen. Why do most religious fanatics claim that the world will end in their lifetime? For example, people have been waiting for the Lord to come back in about five minutes for over a millennium. Buy a clue. Uh, <clears throat> on that timeline, one inch is 150 years. That's a long time. If you have the attention span of a gerbil. If I was to make the 20 billion year timeline the same scale, it would actually need to be 2,100 miles long. That's from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. Which is the whole point of being able to scale things. That way, such obtuse remarks are unnecessary. If we wanted to discuss the distance of the closest galaxy, we would forgo using inches in favor of light years. I don't want a carry chart that big, so I made a new scale for the bottom chart. Congrats. Did the UC Berkeley professor throw himself from the plane, or did he bide his time through Mr. Hoven's pointless non sequiturs by drinking himself into a coma on overpriced gin? Anyway, the professor said... Oh, wait. The dance professor is still alive. That is some liver she has. But he did not know where the matter came from, so I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? You know, who runs the universe with these laws? Gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Who's the lawgiver? A scientific law is a generalized statement that can be applied over a set of conditions, typically ideal. While similar to a scientific theory, a scientific law is much, much less powerful. They simply describe a common observation. They explain nothing. Scientific laws may be part of scientific theories, but they never supersede theories. For example, the universal law of gravitation can mathematically describe the force of attraction between two objects. But the theory of general relativity explains what that force is and how it operates. Scientific laws describe natural processes, much like formation of salt crystals. No magic is required. He said we don't know that for sure. Actually, scientific laws are largely mathematical predictions in ideal closed systems. I said, oh, sir, could you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make something move. Theoretically, the sum of the energy in the universe is zero. On a universal scale, energy is driven largely by gravity, illustrated by this depiction of the accretion disk forming around a supermassive black hole. Who bought the gas to run this machine, anyway? Have these non-sequiturs run thin on anyone else? He said we don't know that either. Unknowns do not end scientific study. They promote it. I said, uh, sir, could I ask you another question? And he said, sure, what else would you like to know? Else? What do you mean, else? You haven't told me nothing yet. By Mr. Hoven's own admission, he has received general information regarding the early Big Bang, the formation of simple elements, the formation of stars, and the formation of planets. If he had been paying attention, rather than congratulating himself on successfully scaling a poster, he would have noticed. I said, does Berkeley, uh, where you teach, have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to you puke, you know? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, any fourth graders in here tonight? Who's in fourth grade? Going into fourth grade. There we go. All right. I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. <laughs> That's before they diagnosed ADD. Uh, we're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round, and we will get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go.